We'll give people a couple, uh, a minute or two to uh, come and sit down while doing this. You could scan this QR code if you haven't done so yet. Technically, yes. Practically, no. <laughs> but you could walk there. <laughs> <laughs> Slide. Hello, welcome to TCPM. Um, we have three co-chairs. Um, my name is my name is Yossi. Hello, Ian. It's what? And Michael Tuxen. Um This is the note. Well, you have seen it several times, I guess. So we won't. Go into detail. The session is being recorded. We have a note taker, Richard. Thank you for, for doing so. Um, you still have a JavaScript, or is that still true? I copied it. I can take care. OK, you, you take care. And we have one um, hint. If you submitted an internet draft and think that TCPM is the right venue for it, put TCPM in the name of the internet draft so we can uh, see it easily. That's the, pro that's the proposed agenda, um, the working group status. Then we have four presentations uh, regarding working group documents. Um, two presentations are remote, two presentations are uh, on-site. And then we have one um, presentation for, uh, of an individual document. Any requests to change this? Any wishes to adopt things? Thank you. These are the documents um, on for which we have milestones. The High Start++ has been um, published as RFC 9406 since the last IETF. We have one document, which is the cubic one in auth 48. And we have the uh, Yang model for TCP in the RFC editor queue still. Uh, it's there for a long time because 
it's depending on another document which hasn't been sent to the RFC editor yet. We have three working group documents um, with milestones in the past, which is the PRR one, the accurate ECR one, and the generalized ECN for which we have presentations uh, today. And we'll update the milestones shortly after the IETF, after talking to the, to the authors. Uh, we have TCP EDO, where we don't have a presentation for, and the TCP, uh, the TCP egg rate request draft, which has a milestone October next year, where we have a presentation um, for any questions regarding the status of the documents. Then we can move on to the first presentation, which is um, PRR. So, Yu Chang, you want to share the slides? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Except I, how do I share the slide? I saw some of you were present, and I was just <laughs> a talk. How can we? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't know I'm supposed to. Project the slides. So you have audio, and so should I run the slides for you? Uh, yeah, could you run the slides for me? Uh, thank uh, okay. you. Uh, wait a minute. This runs the interface. Right. By the way, I was uh, planning to attend physically, but I tested COVID positive yesterday. So I uh, couldn't really go and uh, meet you guys there. Uh, it's such a bummer. <clears throat> so now the slide should be visible. Yep. Just let okay. me know when you. Can you hear me? Do you have a mic you could use? I mean. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? I guess there was some issue with the mic. Hello? Um, we can hear you just um, a little bit better. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, go ahead. Okay, does that work, the audio? Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm here to present the, um, the RC uh, 6937 bits um, about the proportional rate reduction for TCP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we talk about the bits, just a quick re-grab of what that RC is about. It was published in 2013 as an experimental RC. And it's about, think of this as a mini congestion control that is only activated during fast recovery. And it decides what the C1 value is while we are retransmitting and trying to uh, recover from the packet losses. Um, at the very beginning, it's just trying to follow what the underlying congestion control does to say, oh, how much of the C1 reduction you should be doing. And then you will pace the packets out at the ratio indicated by the congestion control over a round trip of time. So when it's Reno, uh, it's like uh, half of the rate. And <clears throat> this idea is not new, it's based on a very, very old proposal called rate halving. And instead of having a uh, half RTT silence, we will do this in a more uh, sort of a smoother way uh, to send out the packets. Um, um, Martin, you have a question, feel free. Yes, Martin Duke, Google. Clarifying question, uh, when you say implemented in Linux, do you mean like Linux mainline or just somebody has a patch? Um, Linux mainline. This has been in Linux mainline for uh, a very long time, yeah. Um, so it's used by default. 
Um, and then over time, you might encounter more losses during the fast recovery. And when the fly finally drops below SS threshold, uh, the old proposal has two modes that you have to configure manually. So you either do a slow start to ramp up to uh, SS threshold, or you do a <clears throat> packet conservation, basically one packet out and you save another packet um, uh, into the network. Um, so um, you have to manually configure that. And <clears throat> an interesting sort of uncommonly known fact is that even though it's a um, mini congestion control during fast recovery, for flow that has experienced long time loss recovery, like constantly in fast recovery, this is actually the more dominating congestion control than the say cubic congestion control uh, itself. Um, and we have seen this happens uh, quite often on video streaming that's suffering like highly policing uh, kind of like um, um, uh, control. Um, that's the flow is constantly losing packets because it's getting policed so it's doing fast recovery and so, so on. Next slide, please. So uh, fast forward uh, 10 years later, uh, uh, PR is the default in Linux, uh, now also in ESD, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, the Rack stack, and I believe also the Windows uh, TCP stack. And then um, I think about <coughs> two years ago, <coughs> the main list uh, or the working group uh, decided let's make it a standard uh, an RFC. So that's why we are doing this uh, revision, right? And over that <clears throat> decade, we have done uh, quite a few uh, refinement to the algorithm. Uh, first is uh, we get rid of this SSRV or CRV mode that the implementation has to pick. Instead, we do this automatically based on if the act indicates if there is further losses or not. <clears throat> and the reason we can do that was also facilitated by the fact that the RAC TLP uh, is now also standard um, in, in RC. And uh, that helps us to learn that, oh, even during the retransmission, that retransmission could get lost and then has to be retransmitted uh, again. <clears throat> um, another one is that <clears throat> To improve the act clocking uh, in the previous algorithm, it's possible that uh, when you enter fast recovery, you may not send a fast retransmit. You might have to wait for an, uh, another act. But in the new algorithm, we kind of force that to happen as soon as possible to make sure we do have act clocking going. Um, another improvement is that we also add the uh, non stack support. Um, and the fourth one, which is the most recent one, is that we discovered there is a, <clears throat> a small issue when let's say if the connection is suffering some uh, reordering uh, before, and it might raise the say the threshold to enter fast recovery a bit longer, like waiting for more stacks to come in. And in those cases, it's possible PRR uh, may not have a very smooth kind of like a sending as it was intended uh, to be. <clears throat> Other than that, there is also all these editorial clarifications that um, <clears throat> what happens on the RC6675 last resort retransmission. Um, <clears throat> um, and then we said that in this case, uh, we don't do any slow start just to be conservative. Relationship with the newer RCs and the old one, like Rocky LP, which we really recommend to use in conjunction uh, uh, with this new RC. And also, how does it work with the pipe algorithm? Um, and also, removing the experimental section because now it's a standard RC. Uh, <clears throat> and also, address a few uh, main list questions. Um, next slide, please. Give me a second. No it hangs up. No. Safari is not the best browser for doing this. Okay, great. Um, 
So I want to focus on the very last sort of uh, refinement that we did. Uh, this is actually um, uh, spotted by Neil. Uh, so uh, great catch. Um, in the old draft, <clears throat> we have this variable called recover FS. Uh, and that's used as sort of the denominator uh, <clears throat> uh, when we compute like during proportional rate recovery phase, how fast do we want to send the packets? Which we use the flight size, uh, which is essentially the send next <clears throat> minus the send UNA at the time when we enter the recovery. <clears throat> Typically, this is not that far away from pipe because uh, a fly size is essentially all the pending packet that hasn't been cumulatively acknowledged, right? Uh, but even if you use SAC, uh, and if assuming a slow start threshold is three, then <clears throat> the difference between recover FS and pipe is just three packets. So it's not a big uh, difference. But what if the, for example, the connection has suffered some uh, reordering or detected some reordering and increase the slow start threshold. Let's say instead of waiting for three acts, it's waiting for 10 more acts or even uh, even more. <clears throat> so if that happens, then the fly size at that time, we could have, when we enter recovery, the fly size could have been substantially higher than the pipe. Because for example, the connection among all the packets that not cumulative acknowledged, maybe 50% of them have been selectively acknowledged, right? So pipe is literally just um, half of the fly size. <clears throat> and because of this discrepancy, not using pipe will cause the proportional rate recovery uh, to kind of like <clears throat> sometimes sense too fast and sometimes send too slow. And overall, you don't want to do that, you want to spread all these packets uh, indicated by C1 <clears throat> that uh, spread it over uh, across the round trip time um, during the recovery. Um, so I think this refinement will fix uh, this issue. And in fact, this has been implemented in Linux. We just didn't spot this difference. Uh, and now we corrected that to match the implementation better. Okay, uh, that's all I have. And I hope that this is the last revision of the RFC and we can uh, push to maybe <laughs> uh, the whatever the last call and then, you know, get this rectified. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any questions, comments? I have. Go ahead. Okay. I have one clarification question. Uh, so as far as I remember, uh, one remaining outstanding comment was how to set congestion window after loss recovery. So I presume that this point has been settled in this version. Uh, yes, okay. it actually, I forget to mention about this change. Uh, sorry about that. So the congestion window now in the spec was clearly that it's the uh, in flight plus same count. Um, and that's included in the uh, official uh, draft right now. And I should have mentioned that, sorry about that. <clears throat> that means draft has been not be updated on this point? Oh no, the draft has been updated at this point, I believe. Uh, I just didn't mention that in this presentation as one of the major revisions, yeah. Okay. Got it. Corey, please go next. Sorry. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was that was actually quite helpful. Um, my question is: is how long has it been in Linux? Um, so, so you say it's been implemented, um, and I know this, but is that actually in mainstream? Are all these things there? Yeah, so right now, uh, everything mentioned, including the revisions, have been upstream. Um, the very first initial version was upstream uh, in, I think, 2013. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, but the final version has been upstreamed as well now, yeah? 
That's right. As in yeah. what's in the draft. Yeah. Yes, that's right. The the draft as is today completely matches what's implemented in the latest Linux update. Yes. Yeah. That was my question and that was the answer. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. That was one of my questions, so thank you. Uh, the other question was whether there were any other implementations besides Linux. Uh, yeah, right. I think it's, uh, 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 I believe, FreeBSD, Windows, and also uh, the Netflix BSD rack implementation. Um, but I do not know how complete, like they, how recent they follow all the other, um, follow this draft, because uh, I don't have access to the source code. Yeah. So Richard Schaffenegger uh, talking explicitly to this point. Um, so PRR, the, uh, the non-BIS specification has been in FreeBSD for I think two years now, approximately. Um, the BIS uh, specification, I have read it and I think it has some great improvements uh, that is uh, to be upstreamed soon. Any other questions? So from the author's perspective, this document is ready for working group last call, right? Oh, we are still running working group last call. Okay, so maybe we restart that. Yeah. So I think, you know, we are, so the current version of the draft, you know, addresses all remaining comments. So we are presuming if you have any other concerns, this is a very good chance for you to speak up. Otherwise, we will start thinking about concluding working group last call. Okay, then thank you, um, Yu Chang. Um, you. If you are in this room and you have not scanned this QR code, please do so. Um, and we can switch to Bob. Should I run the slides? Right, uh, this is accurate ECN feedback, which went through working group last call. Um, and hopefully it's now gone. There's the authors. Please, next slide. Um, I, actually, can you skip the first two, the, this one and the next one? There, so just to record for anyone who doesn't know what accurate ECN is. That was a fast course. Yep. Um, so, uh, working group last call officially ended 24th March, um, but we had some some late comments, particularly from Marco, um, and actually from Michael. <laughs> but but it, you know, I'm not saying late comments aren't good because they 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 found potential problems, um, and also as draft editor, I found two issues with the draft and channeled them into, into the list. Then Marku followed up his comments and um, I posted solutions to all the outstanding issues on the list, um, all, all the new outstanding issues on the list except uh, with no objections, um, except then on the 10th of July, just before the draft deadline, Marku sent a very long email. Um, so um, dealt, dealt with that, I believe, without needing a change to the drafts, but um, posted the drafts this week. Um, for, and, and when I say drafts, that's because there was quite a lot of changes to wrap up the whole working group last call. So I split it into editorial deltas and then technical deltas. And so you don't have all the diff poisoned with all the editorial stuff if you just want to know the technical changes. So 25 is the editorial stuff and 26 is the technical. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the editorial stuff here. That's all fairly um, mundane. I'm going to talk about in the next slides all the technical stuff. All right. So first question was um, Marku's um, ongoing 
concerns about acts of acts. Um, just to give a bit, of, a bit of the background, as of draft 24, um, the increment triggered act rule in Accurate ECN says the receiver must act in uh, every NC marks, in, which in, includes on acts. In you know, that can happen in certain cases, um, and we were trying to make sure that um, any case is dealt with in Accurate ECN. So um, even though ECN capable acts are not standards track, the way Accurate ECN is written. Is uh, and the whole design principle of it is that it reflects things whether or not they're in the RFCs, um, just as a sort of mechanistic reflector, so that you can use it for things like testing for screw ups in mangling in the network and and stuff like that. You know, and you can um, and so all the intelligence is at the sender side. And that it also helps not having two intelligent things both trying to second guess what the other intelligent was. One was as long as you have a, a sort of mechanistic one at the receiver, and then the sender can know that it can apply intelligence without having to guess what intelligence the other end might have applied. <coughs> um, so, um, in response to that, um, we sh shifted the sender side of um, the acts of acts thing which would um, make the acts of acts happen out into the experimental draft on making ECN, um, making pure acts ECN capable. But we, we left the residual part, which is um, acting pure acts um, if they have CE marks on them in the accurate ECN spec, which is proposed standard. And that means that um, if there is no experiment, um, that's making pure acts ECN capable, that feature of the proposed standard will never be exercised, but it's there for anyone who wants to experiment with it. Right. So Mark, who was concerned that still potentially drags a standards track receiver into experiments, and the response um, put on the list was um, it's similar to an experimental um, congestion control using a standards track feedback doesn't make the feedback experimental just because the congestion control is experimental. <coughs> um, Mark, who said, well, it's uh, just just yesterday said yes, but it's it's different because this is new a new feedback mechanism, not an established one. But that's for the working group to um, decide whether they want to do this or not. Okay, it's not it's not a, an objective objection if you know what I mean. It's a it's a concern. Um, so um, I think we we can take questions on that now on, uh, before we move on to the next slide if there are any um, because that seems to be the only real outstanding question. Just well, with Marco it seems to be outstanding. I want to really know whether anyone else is concerned about it. You're not okay. Move on. Okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 my intuition matches with yours. I think this deploying we could deploy this. If there's no such thing as up for us, we could deploy this universally just to like give more feedback. And in itself, this this has no potential damage to the internet. It's what you do with the information that's scary. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next change. Michael found um, while he was um, checking the draft um, that we said in the introduction that Accurate ECN is recommended to be implemented alongside SAC and ECN++. Now, <clears throat> SAC is useful but not, not essential. And ECN++ um, benefits are not specific to Accurate ECN, so we thought, well, isn't, we shouldn't really say that in a what's now a standards track document it's recommended to use something else because it's useful because there's all sorts of things that are useful. Um, it doesn't, doesn't, it's nothing specific to accurate ECN. So um, took that bit out, um, but we recommended that it's implemented alongside SAC and mentioned that TSOPT can be useful as well. And we made the references to SAC and TSOPT normative. 
um, and the ECN++ support, we have a section at the end about how um, accurate ECN works with various current TCP options and experiments and things, and so we put it in there. Okay, next. Right, um, this is um, a change that I noticed when I did a full read of the document, um, which I figured would be important before, because it's this one's been hanging around, I think, six and a half years, so there's potentially a lot of corrupt in it. Um, and um, one thing just fortunately found, um, we defined an acceptable packet as, as one that um, meets all the requirements in the what used to be IFC 793, that's now 9293, and also 5961. And then while I was looking through 9293 about 5961, I noticed 5961 wasn't a requirement. It's, it's, um, it's uh, optional. And I did a bit of digging and asked where's who wrote um, 9293, and he said, well, it's because there's IPR on 5961, so he didn't want to make it mandatory. So I, um, I, I d the, the way we dealt with that was we just said it's um, uh, an acceptable packet is one that passes the tests in 9293 and 5961 or other tests with equivalent protection so that you're not dragging people onto that patent, if, if you know what I mean, by making it mandatory. Look, some, some sort of screwed up looks. Is that not understandable, what I just said? <coughs> uh, I, I don't know if you're reacting to my facial expression. Um, right. I am not, no, none of us are lawyers. And like anytime you like talk about working around IPR, like I get scared. <laughs> Um, I, I, I would have to look at this, uh, and, and, um, well, five, nine, six, one is the, um, what, what are they called? Challenge acts. The what? Challenge acts. Protection against blind attacks. This ah, is implemented okay. in FreeBS. Right, right, right. This okay. is implemented in FreeBSD and I think in Linux too. Yes. But, okay. But it turns out there's Cisco IPR on it. It's got one more year to run. <laughs> okay, this is probably fine, but um, yeah. you know, I'm gonna have to spend my brain about this a little bit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another another thing I found was um, we had in the draft we had all this about forward compatibility. That is making sure that combinations that we weren't using that the spec said that you do something sane when you get them and something standard, you know, that, so that when they start being used, it's clear what previous impl implementations have done. And we'd missed one, um, which is that one highlighted in purple there, um, which um, would have been the nonce if it had ever been used. And, and um, so we, what we've said is treat that as if it w is an accurate N ECN receiver. So if it's ever used in the future, um, sorry, not receiver, accurate ECN server. Um, so if it ever is used in the future, um, whatever it's used for knows that existing deployed systems will use it as accurate ECN. And um, also because there are four um, possible responses for accurate ECN, if, you, if that is used in the future for something else, you need to know which of those four it implies. So we said, well, let's make it that the ECN field hasn't changed. So whatever you sent it as, it, it, it came back the same. Right. Um, and then someone who's dealing with it in future has to deal with how to work around those definitions. <coughs> right. Next. Um, Right, the next one was um, mainly from Vidi, who found some unclear text while trying to implement it, which um, I'll try and explain. And that is around the <coughs> handshake interactions. It, there, there was a, there's a lot about falling back to different sorts of ECN, like the, the old um, 3168, not old, it's current 3168 ECN. Um, and 
but the falling back to no ECN wasn't um, well defined. So um, I found there was a couple of places <clears throat> where the rules for how to do it were in the draft, but they were in rather buried sections. They weren't in a section where it was clearly flagged that it was general. So I moved them into the general section. <clears throat> and um, I'm not going to list them all there because um, this is quite a short talk, but please go and look. This flags the rules we added in. Actually, I've, I've got a, um, a document. It's a PDF I can upload to, say, my, my own website where we went through all the possible cases and, and checked that they're all okay, you know, in order to write packet drill scripts about them and, and stuff like that. So I can upload that as well. If anyone wants to check them all, um, you know, if anyone's got tons of time, um, and um, we need to say, uh, I guess I don't think I need to go through all that here. It's a bit you have to get into the into the depths of it to do it. But please, this is really a heads up to say, please can you go and look at the draft and check that the new stuff that's um, you'll find in the diff makes sense, particularly if you're implementing this. So. Right. Um, and finally, is this finally? No, nearly finally. Um, there were a couple of sections that conflicted, um, and I discovered they'd been conflicting since Ooh, must have been about five years ago um, when there were some changes made that in one section that another section wasn't updated for. And one one said you must do something and the other said you should do something. <clears throat> and the um, the one one said you must test the ACK of a SYN ACK and the other said you should test the initial SYN equals naught packet, which includes that case. So we just made clear that it doesn't include that case and actually then could make that should into a may because the should was sort of like a mix between the must for the one set of cases and the a may for the other. So um, it, the, the should was a, a wider scope that covered things you must do and things you may do, but we, we narrowed the scope of each so it was clear which ones you should do, which ones you must do, and which one you may do. <coughs> okay. And um, then finally, my screw up, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Um, when Ayana gave us the TCP option kinds, um, they gave us 172 and 174, and I wrote 172 and 173 into the spec. Um, fortunately, none of the implementers read the spec. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and um, there was a second error where um, we asked Ayana to make sure there was a note by the um, by the experimental um, option kinds saying you should be using the real ones now, you know, the, 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 the early assignment ones, and again repeated that error. Um, so the IANA, IANA page was correct until we asked them to change the bit at the bottom, which they faithfully did. They faithfully added our error into their own page, my error. Um, anyway, fortunately, IANA noticed this because IANA does that sort of thing. It double checks things and um, it's now all fixed. And as far as we know, unless anyone is producing secret implementations we know, don't know about, none of the implementations noticed any of this anyway. You know, it's all, and that's, I think the, the strength is that um, the implementation first went into Wireshark, which Michael did, and everyone else was working against that. And I guess that's why everyone got it right. Okay, next. And everyone's, there's been a lot of interrupts as well, which would have picked up any problems in the intervening time. So just a quick one on implementation status. Um, Apple um, actually did a, um, a release last October, but um, done a full release of all their alpha stuff in on the 6th of June, including accurate ECN 
in, t in their TCP receiver, off by default for developers to be able to test things against it. And that link there gives you links to the um, how to turn it on, how to test things, and all the rest of it. Um, there's there's a, a number of links via there. Um, there's um, Richard's implementation in FreeBSD, which um, hasn't changed much. Still no um, TCP options in it. it. Hasn't changed much in the last cycle. Um, but once 14.0 is released, Richard is planning to put it into the next um, one so that it's got plenty of time to bake in um, before the next long-term release. And um, thanks to Ilpo for his original implementation in Linux and um, Neil and Xiaoyu for um, maintaining changes to it. It's currently only against v515 of Linux um, and uh, Xiaoyu is bringing it up to date with the spec and then well, um, bring it up to date with the latest Linux before trying to mainline it. And also, um, Bob McMahon has um, cross-compiled it into Raspberry OS. Um, so that's an interesting one for people who are doing things like robot vision um, with the processing of the robot and stuff like that. Um, and it's in Wireshark packet drill. Rich has just put it into TCP dump. That's work in progress, WIP. Um, any news on that, Richard? No. So latest is that this will become uh, uh, put up in upstream on Sunday, next Sunday. OK. And thanks to those four names there for the various packet drill scripts particularly. And finally, next slide. Um, so the, the latest drafts, I hope, wrap up everything from working group last call number one. I've just sent an email to um, Marku um, saying I don't, can't see what we can write into the draft. There is one possible thing we could write, which is that you don't put PSAC on these acts of acts because it would be, doesn't make any sense. But um, it's pretty much clear to me that it doesn't make any sense. I'm not quite sure why you would, but we can do that if you want. Um, and I think you're going to put it into working group last call again soon. Yeah, the plan is to see whether there is feedback based on your presentation here. And if that's not the case, we wanted to run a short working group last call on the latest version. After the ID, I mean, shortly after the ID. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So did you read Marcus? mail from earlier today yeah i just replied to it ah, okay um I, very briefly because i think he was just repeating a lot of the same things again ah, okay he, he was but I, I tried to reply to the people that he had. okay you think you need to do something or you think well, I just, there, there's just this question of the dsac um he's saying well no one knows what they've got to do about dsac on these acts of acts but it's, there's nothing in the DSAC specs that say you would do anything because you're describing the latest um, sequence numbers and there aren't any sequence numbers on an, act of, uh, on an act. So I don't see why anyone would ever think they would put a DSAC on those. You know? Okay. But we can write you don't if, if, it, if necessary, you know. Okay. That would be in the um, ETN++ thing anyway. Yeah. So, Richard? Richard, so the, the, short, the short story is that uh, doing a duplicate accounting without SAC or without any other information is brittle by itself and pretending that this is otherwise is a fallacy. I've had a conversation with Matt Mathis here but, uh, during, this, uh, during this ITF and he agrees. So in the, I think the move of um, the change on the center side into ECN++ and requiring to have a SAC um, negotiated for when you want to actually have ECT marked uh, pure control packets is the way forward. And uh, many of the scenarios are questionable uh, for the for the real world implication, quite frankly. Gauri? You can reorder in the queue. Seriously? 
<laughs> I noticed you used the word order some, somewhere in the draft to describe um, the two types, so that's cool. Uh, no, I was just checking that um, I had my terminology hat screwed the correct way on when I checked this. Is endpoint and host intended to describe what everything does and what this connection does? And did you try and use them consistently or is it used I must kind admit, of... They both used to mean the same thing. They both mean the same yeah, thing. Yes. Is that problematic? Well, I, I just had a to-do list to go and check that they were used to describe what I thought they meant. So if you think they both mean the same, maybe it's easier if they both say the same. I don't know. I mean, I can change host to endpoint, or okay. Like, so, so I, what, uh, what, a host what? is a is a is a, is a host. <laughs> yeah, and an endpoint, I think, is the end of a connection. Yeah. So, uh, okay, um, I asked a question, and you're going to think about it. Okay. This is sort of a new topic, but related to this, but maybe we need to discourage people from doing TCP without SAC ever. <laughs> Matt, um, some people have a very small footprint in which they're trying to put TCP. And I think everybody else does SAC. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Read the transcription. <laughs> I, I just want to observe that uh, Michael, the, 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 the when when you identified yourself at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the transcript re recorded your name as microtoxin. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't write that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, then. Thank you. And we can have the next one. Oh, yes. <laughs> Right, this is about um, what we call ECN++, or the title calls it that as well. Um, the file name is Generalized ECN, and it essentially um, puts um, ECN capability on every packet, not just data. Um, next. I'll jump the motivation and things, because that there repeats that those who aren't familiar with it can have a look at it in their own time. We jump to the next. And that's a very quick recap of how um, there's a table in the in the draft about how RFC 3168 feedback um, uses not ECT on all those things other than data and accurate ECN feedback uses it on everything um, but ECN++ can be used with RFC 3168, not accurate ECN feedback, but a couple of things it mustn't do. Uh, that's the SIN and the pure act. Okay, next. That's just a recap. Um, so changes since the last draft. Essentially, this, this one was, um, quotes, promised to go into working group last call once accurate ECN has gone through. Um, and so I've just got the, this draft has been sitting around um, for quite a while waiting for accurate ECN. So I read through it all and got it up to date and um, you know, took out some cruft and things like that. Um, so now the bits that have changed are, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that's been, not a lot, I mean, there's, there's stuff that's been tidied up. And the only major thing is technically that this stuff about distinguishing acts of acts is now in this draft um, because this is the sender of those um, acts of acts. No, sorry, this is the receiver of the act of the act. So it's the one that originally sent the packet, the, the pure act, 
with ECN capability um, that might get a CE mark on it. Um, so the three mandatory conditions are um, for uh, before you can do this, before you can make ECN capable acts of acts, you must be a negotiated accurate ECN feedback mode, like I said in the in the, that table just then, and you must have negotiated SAC, which um, uh, some people rather like. Um, and then when you test for an incoming, whether an incoming pure rack is a dupac, um, you use the absence of a SAC block for that test. Right? <clears throat> Obviously, if you hadn't negotiated SAC, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and the accurate ECN draft um, mandates that any um, experiment like this one that wants to use ECN capable pure acts would have to do the same thing. It would have to do this DUPAC test. But this one just does it, right? Um, and we took out a test using um, the timestamp because it wasn't reliable, a, a reliable way of distinguishing these DUPACs, um, which was pointed out by Marku. Right. Um, so that, that covers that. The next change, <clears throat> technical change, which is quite um, sort of um, administrative, administrative, if you like, is that the um, draft says there's no obligation to use ECT on all control packets. You can do experiments with them on just particular ones. Um, and it just made a point that you can't say it's ECM++ if you're not doing it on any of them. Sort of um, uh, a bit of obvious, really. Next, um, right? There was um, some text on caching failed attempts to use ECT, um, where if you want to avoid the server having to do caching, you can um, rely on the client um, caching the fact that the um, Synac didn't come back. Um, because that may be due to either the outward or the return, either the SYN getting lost or the SYNAC, sorry, not lost, getting blocked, or the SYNAC getting blocked. So you could potentially do um, client-based caching of the either direction. But it, I, I tightened up that section because there's some limitations on what you can and can't do. Um, so the server doesn't have to do caching, but if it does, um, it gets extra benefit. Um, some other text about um, the argument about reliable delivery of um, congestion notification, um, which was arguments in the original RFC 3168 about how if you send a, um, a control packet that is not reliably delivered, if you make it ECN capable, then the ECN um, capability, the, 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 if that is marked with CE, the, the congestion experienced signal is not reliably de delivered. But of course, the loss signal isn't reliably delivered either if um, that packet got lost, if it's not reliably delivered, because you can't detect that it's got lost, like, like a ACK or something like that. So. Um, that was really a question of, well, it does no more harm than was previous, previously done. So it's, it's, the, most of this draft is a set of arguments knocking down uh, or counter arguments against the arguments in 3168 for not um, using ECN on control packets. And this, this one just tightened that up a bit. Um, sorry, this, these latest changes just tightened that up a bit um, and made arguments more concise, more precise. I wouldn't say the arguments are that concise, though. It's quite long. But I, we've made it so that the, um, the spec of what you do is fairly short, and then there's this long section at the end of all the rationale. Right. Um, and um, that last one. Oh, yes, there was a, an incorrect argument 
um, because retransmissions aren't, you're not meant to put ECN capability on them according to RFC 3168. And um, the argument we had in there against, there were, there were three parts to the argument in RFC 3168. And I noticed that the third part didn't actually describe or didn't, didn't match what RFC 3168 said. So I've corrected that as well. Next. Uh, similarly corrected the outline of ac accurate um, ACK congestion control, which had previously been described as an experiment, but it was informational. And it was a sort of incomplete informational. It, it talked about TCP options and things, but it hadn't actually ever assigned them. So it wasn't really an implemented experiment. And numerous other um, improvements. So as you can see, mostly editorial stuff, apart from that first slide. So I think now once accurate ECN is out, out the way, if it does get out of the way, this will be ready for working group last call as it stands. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Okay. So as you said, the, the plan is to finish work on accurate ECN first and then focus on this one. But it, it's a good time to review this one. I'll put this in your review stack if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation is on TCP a great request and it's charged remotely. I can run the slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez and I'm going to present the last update of the draft entitled TCP ACK rate request TAR option. Uh, my co-author is John Crocroft from the University of Cambridge. Uh, next, please. Give me a second. Sure. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, so thank you. So first of all, a uh, quick um, review of the motivation for the draft. Delayed DAX is a widely used mechanism which is intended to reduce protocol overhead. However, it may also contribute to suboptimal performance in a number of scenarios, such as so-called large congestion window scenarios, where congestion window size would be much greater than the MSS, where saving more than one of every two acts may help improve performance, and also so-called small congestion window scenarios, meaning a congestion window size up to the order of around one MSS, where delayed acts may incur delay, limit congestion window growth, and so on. Next, please. So this document defines a TCP option, which allows a sender to request an act rate from a receiver. On the slide, you can see the main option format which carries uh, the R field, which corresponds to the requested ACK rate, uh, which currently has a maximum value of 127. And there's the special case of R equal to zero, which uh, means the request of an immediate ACK without modifying the steady state ACK rate. Next, please. So the draft was adopted in February. Today I'm presenting version 02, which uh, mainly aims to address the comments received in Yokohama. Next, please. Well, there's uh, uh, maybe a question in the queue. Clarification, a clarification question. So zero means to request an immediate act on this particular packet, and one means request an immediate act on this packet and every subsequent packet. Is that correct? Th that's correct. OK, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. So now let's go through the updates in the draft, in this version of the draft. 
The first updates are in section five, which focuses on the topic of stretch acts, which may happen as a consequence of using TAR. So section 5.1 focuses on a particular consequence, which is sender burstiness. So here uh, in the last meeting, there was a common uh, suggestion by media to use normative language uh, to suggest use of TCP sender pacing to address this problem of sender burstiness. So basically, uh, the old phrasing is the one that you can see on the slide where uh, the sentence was one technique that can be used to mitigate the problem uh, is TCP sender pacing. Now we are using normative language in the form of uh, one technique that a sender normative may use to mitigate and so on. So perhaps here, one question could be whether may is sufficient, perhaps we could increase this to a normative shoot. And well, uh, feedback on this will be very much welcome. Yes. Christian, is that true? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm looking at your draft and comparing to the TCP delayed, uh, to the quick delayed act draft. And there, there is one part which is in the quick delayed act draft, which is not in your draft which is basically autonomous decision by the receiver to send an ACK despite uh, the, the red telling them not to do so. And uh, the general idea is that if the receiver sees from the stream of packets that there is probably a packet loss, then for example, uh, in quick, it's easy because you packets are individually identified. In TCP, it's a bit harder. But uh, if you, the, the idea is that if the receiver sees that oh, there is probably a packet loss. There is a hole in the sequence. There are several holes in the sequence, or something like that. Then uh, it makes sense to send an ACK immediately because that will immediately trigger the correction of the packet loss by the, by the sender. And uh, you may want to look at add text like that. You don't have to change the format of the option, but you probably want to add a text discussing this kind of stuff. Yes, thank you very much for the suggestion. It, it really uh, is, uh, appears to be interesting and useful functionality. So yes, uh, as you mentioned, it probably won't change the format, but uh, yeah, we'll definitely look at this uh, for the next update of the draft. Thank you. Thank you. So next, please. Another update is in section 5.3, which is still one of the consequences of stretch acts, which is lower frequency of RTT samples. So in the last version of the draft, we had some sentence which was mostly following similar text in precisely the quick working group document that was mentioned now, the act frequency draft. So the old text included a normative shoot and it was a sender should trigger an ACK being sent by the receiver at least once per RTT. Then um, what we did in 02 uh, is a train an attempt to summarize the discussion that happened in Yokohama in the quick working group um, in this regard. So the new text tries to be a summary of that and has no normative language. So the new text uh, reads as sender needs to trigger a sufficient number of acts per RTT. So it's number depends on the specific scenario with the best currently known value being roughly in the range of at least one to four. So again, this is tentative. And any feedback uh, on how we could best uh, address this topic would be also very welcome. So uh, next please, or yeah, this Ian in the queue. Uh, I, I think what you have there is, is quite good and quite close. I, I might 
uh, I'd be happy to kind of wordsmith it instead of using the word best, because I think it does, it is so scenario dependent, but I think from a normative perspective, you're doing fine. It's just like, I, I, I can um, maybe email me and I'll, I'll try to kind of wordsmith it just a little bit of what I might suggest and give you some options of what I would suggest and you can decide which one you're like, or if you'd like any of them, but, but otherwise it looks great. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, any any idea to improve exactly the, the wording will be really great. Thank you. Uh, this is Yoshi from Fora, just individual, individual opinion, but I may prefer normative language here. Actually, this is because if, you know, arc frequency is bigger than window side, then we see bus side effects, you know. Uh, reduce uh, because of delayed arc performance is delayed, arc, arc sampling rate is you know, lower. And then, so in special case, we can ignore, you know, we know how, what will happen. But uh, in most of case, this has many back by side, side effects. So I, my, this is my personal opinion, but I prefer using nomading language here. So uh, if, if I can, um, what kind of normative uh, would you still prefer the use of normative should? Sorry, sorry, what was your question? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, uh, you, you mentioned you would still prefer to use normative language. So, in yes. that case, would you tend to prefer maybe the should, the normative should? Yeah, should should I prefer should? Because sometimes you want to ignore it. Thank you. Uh, Ian Sweat, I, I think this is a difficult subject because we've gone back and forth quite a bit about this in quick and ideally, especially with the congestion control working group now being a thing, um, I think we're trying harder and harder to get like reasonable alignment between these drafts. Um, and as a result, I'd prefer not to have normative language in general. Um, but uh, I think there's also the question of whether it's nor normative around round trip or normative around congestion window, because those are two different things. Um, but an issue about congestion, once per congestion window is that the, um, obviously the receiver doesn't know this, only the sender knows what their congestion window is. So basically a recommendation to say like, you probably shouldn't set your like act frequency to a number um, that's larger than your congestion window. It seems mostly reasonable except maybe when it's not like data center networking where, I don't know, things are interesting. Um, so I don't know, it's a lot of thoughts. Um, but I think the key thing is I, I think we do, I, and I kind of call out to Martin here, but like if we can get reasonable synchronization between what we're doing with TCP and Click here, that would be ideal in my opinion. Thank you. No, no, I, I definitely would like that. It's. <laughs> <laughs> it's challenging because there's like different ADs and all that stuff. Um, I, like, I don't think there's any substitute for, for just like you guys talking to each other. <laughs> and then when, like when quick has a huge, if you guys like reach convergence and quick has a huge problem with it, then you communicate back to TCP and your TCPM like objects then have that, have Ian, then you conduct that back into quick. And if, if you two are going to email together, that's really like perfect because this is kind of hard to do at the, AD ISG level, the timing and all that. I guess the challenging part is if like, yeah, maybe we should have just done this in CCWG if it existed, but like the challenging part is if that you finish first and it goes up in the, in, up the channel and then like TCPM is a bunch of bright ideas. Um, but uh, I guess we'll see where we are in maturity of these two things. I mean, one thing we could do is we could set up like some sort of document dependence thing. Um, reference thing, potentially, which would automate the process of keeping them in sync. But I don't know where we are with the relative status of these two docs, so yeah. No substitute for just talking to each other. OK, thank you. So the last update <clears throat> is in section six, which is entitled Changing Deck Rate During the Lifetime of a TCP Connection. Um, here we have added some text to the existing content uh, with the aim to somehow answer to a question by Yoshi in the last meeting. So first of all, 
In this section, we talk about the congestion window size, which increases during slow start and then tends to settle. And that uh, value will depend on the underlying BDP. And uh, we explain that the BDP may change, for example, due to some path change. But we also have added, uh, and here's the, the new content, is because the, the question by Yoshi was, what happens if uh, maybe R is equal to six or eight, and then at some point, the sender retransmission timer expires, the congestion window size goes down to one. So what happens next? So we've added some text uh, in somehow generic uh, terms that the congestion window size may also change due to re relatively sporadic phenomena, such as retransmission timer expiration. And in such cases, accurate updates may be needed as well. Actually, uh, Richard suggested also the use of some generic text. So we, we added also in that, uh, in that direction that the, the sender may opt to request an act rate that it considers appropriate at any moment. So here, the, the point was not specifying in detail how to react to each specific possible situation, but rather to keep this general guidance and, and remember uh, the reader and, and the implementer about that. So um, I don't know if there's any comment on that. Otherwise, yeah. So other than what we have discussed today, uh, we are not really aware of other outstanding issues. So we would also like to ask uh, if to the working group if there are areas of improvement, suggestions on that. For example, the draft was reviewed quite a lot before it became a working group document. So uh, it would be very, very helpful if we could get some review on the more recent form of the draft. So that's everything from my side. Any comments or questions? Thank you. Any comments, questions? Hi, uh, Neil Cardwell, Google. I was just curious if you could share um, the status of any implementations or any implementation experience there is. Well, I, I'm only aware of some effort, which was led actually by, by Michael, Michael Tuxon on a prototype implementation on FreeBSD. But at the moment, I'm not aware of any other efforts in that regard. Yu Chang. Hi, can you hear me? Um, so how does this option work in, in the face of GRO because uh, with GRO today, a receiver um, kernel may receive a jumbo packet of say 40, 40 MTUs, right? And then if the option specify 20, do you send two X right away? Um, so the, the, the value, right, this R in the option is it specified to like the MTU size data segments? Like what if you receive just one jumbo data segments that has like 40 um, MTU packets? Does that make sense? Yeah, if, if I remember right now, uh, the text talks about the R being uh, specified in terms of uh, segments regardless of the size of the segments. I would need to double check again what's the current wording. But then this say um, the data segment we, uh, refers to MTU size or MSS size segments, right? But the receiver actually receive, I mean the kernel, for example, Linux, receive a jumbo SKV of worth of 40 MSS packets or payload. <clears throat> um, does it, send two X, um, let's say R is 20, right? And I, I got 40 packets in a row in literally one shot. Does it send two X immediately back to back? Um, I believe there's no, no particular text about that at the moment in the draft. So maybe we need to, to consider that case and, and see how to add it to the receiver behavior specification. 
Yeah, because in this case, it seems a bit wasteful to send, say, two acts. If one act can just act everything, then and both are immediate anyways. Uh, so yeah, it will be good to clarify that. Uh, but a, a more meta comment is uh, when I'm reading the draft is, is that a bit of an overkill to have an option just to specify how many acts to send? Like, could there be just receiver heuristic to say, hey, the remote sequence might be small, so let me not delay the act. I mean, if we compare with that option, how much more benefit does this op uh, this draft provide? Well, per perhaps there are cases where the sender so, so here the assumption is the sender knows what is best in, in different cases. So that's why we have the, the option to communicate the request at that rate. So this is like the, the sender is kind of in control or trying to control. The receiver can always ignore the request. Um, but yeah, the, the assumption is that the sender has some knowledge of what would be the, the right value for the act rate. So I guess that's where uh, it's actually useful to have an option. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not sure that's not that useful, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to offer um, one uh, potential response to Yu Chung's question about um, you know, how important this would be in practice. I think one important, really important use case for this is in data center networking. So right now, um, I think we see workloads in data center Linux TCP, where the, um, the fair share of the BDP is sort of one packet or less. And so the congestion window can be just one or, or two or something like that. And in those cases, I think right now, Linux TCP traffic is sort of relying on a heuristic in the Linux TCP code that says, if I receive a, a packet with the CWR bit indicating that the data sender has is doing a, an ECN based CWIN reduction, then their CWIN might be really small, like one or two packets, and I better act right now. Um, and I think our internal performance tests have shown that that heuristic is is critical for data center performance. And my, if I recall, the this the accurate ECN standard no longer. Um, has a CWR as a signal from the data sender to say it's slowing down and may have even repurposed the CWR bit. I'm not remembering off the top of my head. But I would think with accurate ECN, when you're no longer using RFC 3168 ECN, it would be important for the sender to have this way, or it would be very useful for the sender to have this way to signal that its C wind is super small and it wants an ACK right away. The push bit as a hint or something. Or if we receive just one packet, then let's just act immediately because that really hurt. Would that really hurt the ECM workload? Right? Like I'm trying to really compare Is there any local heuristic that we don't have to? Because getting an option, implementing an option, you have offload, like uh, hardware, capability. Compatibility concern. I mean, it's it's a big <laughs> uh, change uh, for something that may be local heuristic. Can still offer say fifty percent of the, the benefit. Yeah. Uh, this is Stuart Cheshire from Apple. <clears throat> uh, I want to echo the previous comment, but in a totally opposite context. Uh, one of the reasons I'm uh, hoping to see this document published is for very small constrained IoT devices. And a lot of these devices today are using UDP for reasons we could talk about over beer. Um, but one of the arguments they use why they can't use TCP is they're so constrained with memory, they only have enough buffering to send one packet and they wait for the act before they send the next one. And if the receiver at the other end is some general server on the internet that doesn't know, well, then it's waiting for a second packet before it sends the ACK. And every round trip suffers the delayed ACK timeout. So um, that's the use case that, that I would like to put to use is being able to say, please ACK every single packet, because otherwise I'm just going to stall waiting for the delayed ACK timeout. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think I'm not uh, disagreeing like um, no delay act or immediate act is useful. It's useful in so many scenarios. I think I'm just saying that is using a new option the best way because um, having working on TCP fast open and all that, I know it's a long transition to actually get a new option really working. Um, like fast open today, a lot of them still use the experimental O option. Um, so I'm just asking, are there more convenient unilateral deployment feasible solutions to not delay the act? <laughs> So um, I, I also know about some uh, implementations which use a heuristic with the push flag, even though it was never intended in that way. I mean, every, everybody is free to come up with a change to say that the push flag should perhaps trigger an immediate act. Uh, Martin Duke, Google, no hats. Uh, this is real crazy talk, but like, we do have all these act thinners in the network and, and like, <laughs> in TCP land, they can actually read this thing. So, so maybe, you know, obviously legacy act thinners are just stuck with, but like maybe future act thinners could even use an option like this constructively to not, not ruin everything. Um, just a thought. Any more comments? Okay, so then thank you for the presentation and looking forward to a new version addressing some of the issues which have been brought up. Okay, thank you. So now Yoshi is. Hello. <coughs> Can you hear me? Okay. So, hey, my name is Yoshi. Today, I would like to talk about aggregated option for sin option space extension. Next slide, please. So, uh, let me start from a quick recap. What is uh, aggregated option? Uh, aggregated option is a TCP option that can aggregate uh, multiple TCP option into a single option. So. Uh, as we know, the current TCP option format is not optimal for space. So by aggregating multiple TCP option into one, uh, we can save option space. And then the goal of this proposal is to provide a solution for limited option space in scene segment, which is long outstanding issue for TCP. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is aggregated option format. So aggregated option format can have three byte or six byte ranks, uh, depends on how many uh, aggregated block contains in this option. And then it can contain aggregated block from one to four. And then each aggregated block has six bits and each uh, six bits uh, represent one options. So one group ID accommodates uh, six options so, and then since we have you know, four group IDs uh, at total, uh, we can support 24 options uh, with this option format. Okay, uh, there are several updates from the previous version. Um, so first update is to add some text for user time up option. So because uh, in the previous meeting, uh, Raz mentioned about the uh, user time up options. So this is the uh, exceptional uh, TCP option that does not require a scene segment. So I have some text about these options. And then next update is uh, predefined aggregated options. In the previous meeting, um, some people suggest that you know, we should think about aggregating existing options. So I have thought about this for a while. And then um, in the current draft, it's proposed to use group ID one to aggregate commonly used options such as SAC, MSS, uh, Windows scale. 
And then, so since, uh, and also this, does, this current version of the draft doesn't have this, but uh, um, I'm going to add some scope of the proposal. Uh, I mean, whether this proposal is only for limited controlled environment or for the internet, or uh, you know, how to deploy uh, this proposal. Um, I will try to address these comments that I got uh, in the next version. Okay, so this is a predefined aggregated option format. So as I mentioned, that's you know, a predefined aggregated option use group ID one. So it has six bits. And out of six bits, um, the current proposal utilizes four bits uh, for to store the value to window scale option. So uh, the window scale option value will be from zero to 14. So by having four bits, uh, we can accommodate all possible value for window scale option. And then um, if this, you know, value is 15, and then it indicates that the you know, window scale is not included in this option. Okay, Richard, you have a question? Yeah, it's again, uh, the, the MSS thing, I'm not really happy because mm -hmm. it precludes the MSS clamping in, mm -hmm. uh, in existing equipment. Um, I don't quite know what, we have had this discussion before, what you gain by having explicit uh, bit for the MSS uh, because just the, uh, the existence of this aggregate option it, in itself could already mean that you're having an MSS of 1416 or 1440. Okay, yeah, yeah, I prepared a slide after this. Michael Jerkson from the floor. Um, yeah, I want to go to in, in the same direction. So I think the MSS option is different from the other ones because middle boxes uh, work on that. So maybe mm -hmm. um, another possibility would be to just not deal with the MSS within this extension, but just leave the MSS option always there explicitly to be processed by the middle boxes. So you mean you do not aggregate MSS? Exactly, never aggregate okay. MSS. Okay. Okay, and then um, the rest of one bit, uh, two of, rest of two bit, one of one bit is used for SAC permit. And then uh, if this bit is said, you know, SAC permit option is not specified because SAC permit is just one bit information. So this is easy. And if this bit is not, if bit is not set, SAC permit is not included in the option. And then, so I just, you know, this is, prob I know this is controversial, but uh, in the current version, uh, one bit is used for MSS. And if this bit is set, uh, it indicates uh, as if uh, MSS value 1460 is specified. Uh, in case of IPv6, uh, MSS 1440 is specified. If this bit is not set, MS is not included in the option. Next slide, please. And then, so I know uh, this current you know, format has little controversial. And one possibility is you know, we can aggregate more values. But uh, as far as I you know, check the uh, traffic samples from a wider project and the cater, um, it's very difficult to find efficient common value for MSS value in C option. And so, but. Uh, uh, in these traffic samples, you know, by you know, aggregating 1460 and 4040, at least in this data set, I can cover uh, more than 40% of MSS options. Okay. Michael Trickson again. Mm -hmm. I still not think it's a good idea to aggregate the MSS option, but if you want to, mm -hmm. you might use the values also used by Synth Cookies because this is another mechanism. It's implementation dependent, but there are Mm -hmm. That's what several implementations consider important values of MSS. Yeah. Until I unexpectedly retired from Google, my day job was working on a project called Measurement Lab. And um, a Measurement Lab runs a six measurement infrastructure that you can <laughs> mostly get to by clicking buttons in browsers. And our, our run rate is about 3 million tests a day. MSS is all over the map. I'm actually astonished at how many values there are uh, that we see. Uh, and I can probably find you a query that will let you look at our data. 
the data is public and free. Okay. Okay. We'll be on to the next slide. Martin? How many okay. slides okay. are there left? Uh, okay. Two. Uh, well, all right. So I'll, I'll save my big comment, but for the MSS comment, um, uh, like the current, the current, like the 9293 defaults suck. Like it's 512, right? If you don't have the option at all. So what, what is attractive to me about this is that potentially this option could indicate I don't use the dumb defaults. I use good modern defaults, but I am concerned about what middle box, yeah, Michael's point. Like what are middle boxes doing exactly with the MSS option? Um, will they add one? If it's not there, which which I guess would be okay because that would supersede this option, or will they do something much worse? So I'm concerned about the middle boxes not reducing the MSS as they do right now, and then you have to do path MTU black hole detection because oh because the middle box will assume it's five twelve or whatever the default is. Oh, no, I actually... mean my middle box at home reduces. I mean, if you're on a DSL line, it reduces the MSF to uh, 1492. And if this is not processed anymore, my peer thinks it's 1500. And then we... Well, no, it's not 1500. So the... 1500 is what my, my machine thinks. Oh, oh, I'm thinks, sorry. Okay, and my, okay, okay, my sorry. access router reduces this to 49. So, so like the imperial question here is like, what would it do? What would your middle box do if there's no MSS option in the TCP header? Would it assume it was 512 per 9293 or would it, would it just insert an MSS option assuming that it needs to do that? And like that's an empirical question of how, how, how like bad these things are and you know the usual answer is boundlessly bad. So I, it'd be interesting to me to see what it did and like maybe there's not a problem here, maybe there is and that's something that we can investigate. But I doubt it can find the right value. So it might use a too large value, fifteen hundred, or it use uh, the default, which is much too much too small. But it, how should it guess the right value? Except it has the code put in this always, and I don't think they do. Yeah. Okay. People are rolling out VPNs like crazy. Um, and lots of scales and evidence is that a larger and larger fraction of just ordinary traffic is tunneled and, and the MSSs are screwy. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so this might be another not so good or great idea, but uh, so other way to you know, aggregate MSS option is uh, to to use rate negotiation. Rate negotiation means use third segments on the fourth segment. So uh, this is a you know simple example of uh, rate negotiation. Uh, when client send a thing, it's use send aggregated option with MSS set set on. And when send a send vaccine act, it's also aggregated option with MSS bit on. And after this, uh, they start rate negotiation, which means by using third segment, it send MSS option. And then, and Saba also send back MSS option by using fourth segment. So this is uh, the example of rate negotiation. And next slide, please. But uh, this approach has obviously a drawback. Uh, when the client try to send data with a SADAC, then at this point, client doesn't know the proper MSS. Uh, then they have to use the default MSS to send these data. Uh, of course, then in the next round trip, uh, the client receives the MSS from, from server. So this next round trip time is okay, but only this round trip time, it has to use default MSS. And then also, yeah, as we discussed, there are some middle box issues. So if middle box doesn't understand this rate of negotiation, it might be screwed up. That's a drawback of this approach. Okay, Richard? Yeah, exactly what I, <laughs> you just pointed out. I, I suspect the vast majority of middle boxes that do MSS clamping will actually only look at the MSS option while the SUN bit is also set. So if you set the MSS option uh, when the SUN bit is not set, <laughs> that, needs, that needs to be investigated at the very least. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually this is the uh, last slide of my presentation. I'm still you know, thinking about how to aggregate uh, predefined option. Uh, and then, so today um, from my impression, most of the people seems to 
you know, omit aggregating MSS. But yeah, if they, there are any other better ideas, you know, suggestions, please let me know. Martin? All right, Martin Duke again. So I, I, on and off, I've grappled with this like option space question again, again, again. And I, like, I, I keep coming down to, I, I think we have to think really hard about use cases here because since obviously some paths will eat the option and some servers will not support the option, um, uh, there's a trade-off here. So like there's some, obviously there's some big option that you really want, which, which is driving this whole thing. And you either have to accept that um, maybe some of the older options like, like uh, you know, WScale or all that, are, like the value of, of this big option that you have exceeds the performance value, pot the, potentially lose the performance value of the, of the other options that you're compressing here. Or alternatively, um, uh, you're, you're will, like the, the, this new option is so valuable that you're willing to potentially eat an RTT because the thing fails and you have to go back and, and discard some of them, right? But I mean, so <clears throat> uh, there's some risk that's just as good deployed at all because that killer app doesn't exist. And, and I think it would be worth thinking through that a little more. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tim Shepard. Um, I'm trying to understand if I'm about to send my first send to open a connection, mm -hmm. how do I know whether the other end will understand this or not? Because if they don't, I need to include the SAC and the window scale mm -hmm. and everything anyway. Am I supposed to include those and this? What I don't know. Yeah. That's part of the de uh, deployment plan. So probably you, in the first destination, if you send a packet to the uh, this this destination first time, you might include both options, aggregate option and the original option. But uh, when they you know, respond remember, like, yeah, then okay. it's cached. That's one strategy to deploy this option. Thank you, but I, I tried to read your draft quickly and I didn't see anything in there about uh, yeah. how to think that, that there were that this problem even exists. So maybe you should add. Mm, or, right. or sorry if I missed it in there, but I didn't, don't no, think no. it was in there. Actually, I, I didn't get written down yet. So okay. I, have to, I, I have to update the draft. Thanks for pointing out. Lars, I got so two observations. One for the uh, MSS option, right? I think, I mean, this, this particular option that you're proposing is pretty extensible. And so if you, and this is probably the hardest bit. So if you can just like take that out for now. Um, and, you know, we can always, when we figured it out, do an extension or then roll it in. I think it would, wouldn't let us go down this rat hole. I mean, we're all, it's a, it's a nice juicy problem and we all want to like get, get into it and figure it out, but it's sort of distracting from the broader discussion on this option, which I think I had the exact same reaction to Tim, right? This is stuff like this has been proposed and it's never been that we couldn't do it. It's always like, how do we actually get it rolled out? Right, and, and sort of exactly this sort of, you know, if you don't know that the other person speaking it, you got to basically do the new thing and the old thing which seems like a step backward to maybe go two steps forward at some point. And, and yeah, you can maybe cache it or something uh, like you would cache an MSS or something. But it's, so I think that is, that is sort of the, the questions that are gonna make or break this extension, not like, you know, can we squeeze this or that and other in. And so I really sort of encourage you to focus on, on that part. Like how do we actually, would, how would we deploy this and pretty immediately see a benefit? Thanks. You Chen. Yeah, as uh, um, you're presenting your draft, I started looking at all the synapses and wonder like how many of them are truly necessary. Then I have this question that why do we even need SAC OK options to begin with? You can put it in the date, the packet and then if the receiver want to use it, then use it or, the, you know, so maybe it's unrelated to this discussion, but it seems that at least SAC OK option is kind of useless to me. That and give firewalls a great opportunity to strip it if he doesn't understand SAC. <laughs> okay. But that means I have to update SAC draft. <laughs> That's true. <yeah. laughs> but that gives us uh, sorry, two more bytes or four more bytes <laughs> for the synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> 
Any more comments, questions? Then thank you. Thank you. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, bad news is we ran 10 minutes longer than we had originally planned. Good news is due to the rescheduling, we had 30 minutes more and you get 20 minutes left. See you in Prague. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if they no, do it yes. automatically no. and fill it no. out what the time and amount of time is. No, <laughs> that's why I kept glancing through your sheet for sure. Very much. As a speaker, I really like it. Yeah. It's easy for me to.